Okay then, Namo Myoho Renge Kyo. Welcome everyone. Thanks for being here. I hope that you're in uh, good, safe conditions and healthy. Um, <laughs> I don't know why I'm in a silly, I'm in a silly mood this morning. Um, I'm going to try to keep it on the serious side. <laughs> I don't know if I can if I can do it. I don't know what's going on with me. All right. So here's a here's a typical question. We talk about this all the time. And uh, in case you don't know, we're continuing with a treatise on the on protecting the nation. And Nitrin is uh, this is a treatise, uh, a long document uh, meant for uh, other Buddhists, other Buddhist teachers, but also for um, governmental people. Governmental in that. The government of the shogunate is an authoritarian government and it's stratified throughout Japan. So when Nichiren writes something like this, he writes it as a complete study document, uh, much in the same way as when the um, leaders of uh, not just Japan, but China and India and uh, Korea and wherever Buddhism has has grown and spent lots of hundreds of years or even de decades. Uh, there's always a point of competition between uh, who's going to share the pot, who's going to share, in other words, the money pot, the the support of the government. Um, you know, people donate, but most of the people are not wealthy, right? You have uh, two classes, basically, the wealthy and the peasantry. Um, I'm not talking about the caste system now. I'm just talking about financial. And so uh, the people in charge of programming the people's minds um, to make them docile to the government, uh, they compete for allegiances and support from the wealthy. Uh, many times, most times, those are people somehow in the halls of government. Um, but, you know, whether they are ministers, in other words, part of the cabinet of the, whether it's an emperor or a king or in the shogunate, in this case, the powerful families, they are, and powerful families also throughout the country uh, are special connected people with uh, because of the real estate and the lands they command their own samurai forces and stuff um, are or have the ear of the central uh, governments throughout the country. So when I say he writes a document for the government understand that there are many, many people uh, involved in that umbrella, the controlling elites, in other words. So uh, many of them, although they may uh, practice some school of Buddhism, again, because of the favoritism and the political clout, certain teachers are looked upon by many clans, many aspects of government as being the Buddhism, um, but there are eight different schools, mainly in extant in Japan at the time of Nichiren, and some of them have a good foothold in certain areas of Japan, while others are in several areas of Japan. So there's competing, right? It's all about uh, uh, favor, control, money. 
Some things never change, right? Still happening today. So, um, all of this is simply to put some context around when Nietzsche writes a, a treatise or a long form uh, document like this, he knows that he's having to address the elephant in the room, and that is, who the hell are you, Nietzsche? Who do you think you are? And Nietzsche has got quite a reputation quite quickly to be the odd man out, the one who's calling all of these powerful people out and saying, you're not doing this right. You don't know what you're talking about. You, I will challenge any day in a debate. I will bury you. You don't understand Buddhism. <gasps> what? Well, it's not just the person, the teacher, the head honcho that he's challenging. He's challenging hundreds of years of history in Japan. He's, hunt he's challenging cultural norms, right? Let alone the elites, the powerful with you know, who rule literally with the blade of the katana. Yeah? So, he's very thorough in, and he treats, as we're witnessing in this treatise on uh, protecting the nation, what could be more political a statement, right? You guys all think you're powerful and you stand for Japan, but you're not protecting the nation. Let me show you how a lowly, normal, everyday fisherman's son monk. I'm going to tell you. <laughs> okay? So understand, when, when he writes this kind of document, he's treating it as though he's in a scholarship debate about Buddhism. He has to. Because he knows he's going to have these opinions coming at him. Hard and fast. So before he can get to the meat of the matter... He spends a lot of time saying, this is why you're wrong. This is why the Lotus Sutra is. This is the word of Shakyamuni, not me, a fisherman's son. But here it is in the scholarship. Hello. Right? He spends a lot of time. And it, it's a benefit for you and I. Because we get a history lesson. We get a justification lesson. We see how Nietzsche comes to his conclusions. They're very obvious. He's not the first to do this. He points out how it's been done by successive scholars in the past, long before him. And in Japan, from Dengyo. You know, but somehow this always falls apart. What up? So, <laughs> he's a ballsy guy, this Nichiren. The emperor is freaking naked. Look. Right? But anyway, back to the scholarship. What we have is a, a slow roll and boil of the history of Buddhism, even the history of Japan and China and Korea, and how all of these came to be. And Nietzsche's like, well, right? And once he makes his multifaceted argument for this is Shakyamuni's teaching, this is how it's practiced properly, this is what it, it implies the implications of this practice and then he's going to start dropping more quotes and more pointing now that i've justified this is the word of shakyamuni this is what buddhism is let me now show you what it says about our present our current state of affairs why we're having these huge problems with famine and, and uh, invasion from abroad. It's no mystery. It's right here in the words of Shakyamuni and the scholarship of thousands of years. So he doesn't just come out and say that, to which the elites would say, bugger off, <laughs> right? But he makes his argument from the ground up. Now, if you challenge what Nietzsche is saying, you're challenging a lot more. You, you, you have to admit that you're not listening. You have to admit that you don't choose to do this the right way. You have to admit that you're just going to rule by the sword and shut up anybody who's logical about this. So it's a brilliant device. It's an excellent teaching. And I remember Nietzsche constantly was trying to change the minds of the elite because he knew if he got them to wake up, then the people of Japan would immediately just fall into line. Authoritarianship, right? That's why I keep talking about that. 
people like to be told what to do. And you can tell people, the general, general statement, you can tell people what to do wrongly all along. And even if people realize, you know, no, uh, we're going to say the emperor has beautiful clothes on, right? They won't challenge it and they'll just go on that way. Until finally, every uh, the the authoritarian at the top goes, "Oh crap, he is naked." Then everyone in the country will go, "Yeah, yeah, we do. We did want to say anything, <laughs> right?" <laughs> so this is what Nietzsche is constantly trying to do: is get the top to wake up, so that he can spread this Buddhism as Shakyamuni said would need to happen in this age here and abroad the way he can connect with the most amount of people and change hearts and minds is through the leadership simply using authoritarianship as a helpful device pretty courageous way to go so one of the things because one of the most popular teachings in his day was the Nembutsu you know, you still hear it if you watch any um, Chinese, um, uh, and there's a lot of them, uh, kung fu movies, right? Even Jet Li, a master. You'll hear them chanting Amida Buddha's name, Nembutsu, still today. It was, it was rampant everywhere. And so Nitrin is saying, you guys, you're not getting it. And so one of the concepts in Nambutsu that is really, really, really not Buddhist is this idea that if you're good and chant Amida's name all the time, after you die, whee, you go to the pure land. Sounds a lot like religion, doesn't it? All those death cults that can't, you can't possibly have it good in this life. This life is for suffering. Right? Even Shakyamuni started with that in his Four Noble Truths. Remember? All life is suffering. Okay, you got it. All life is suffering. Wah, wah, wah. But the very next statement he made is so what causes all that suffering, people? Second Noble Truth. It's your constant craving and clinging to material, to physical, like it's real. Hello. It's a temporary thing. It's constantly changing. There is nothing permanent in the entire universe. Right? So that's the first noble truth that he's trying to get people to change their perception. So if you want to stop suffering, you don't have to wait till you die. <laughs> this life isn't about suffering. This life is your opportunity with a mind of perception to go, let me change that perception and stop the formations of those attachments. That's the third noble truth, right? Okay, so there's a way I can change my life now. Yeah, here's the way, fourth noble truth. It's the way you conduct your behaviors in life. How you set up particular goals that support this amazing life rather than seeing it as a place of torture and hell, hell of incessant suffering. It's this life when you choose that. You don't have to choose that. You can change that and you can experience this life fully without those stresses and anxieties those are fake. Those are built. That's delusion. That's the Four Noble Truths right there. And he teaches that in every way possible for over 40 years of his life. And finally, because he has to do so before he perishes, and hopefully some of his disciples are getting this, they've, they've, he's elevated them to the point that they should be they have the capacity to understand this. But even if they don't, in the future, some 2,500 years after I pass away, I'm extinct, there will be those scholar monks, people, 
who will grasp what I'm about to teach you. And then, rather than this teaching completely disappearing, they will take the mantle and propagate this widely throughout the world so that people can realize how to live this life maximally. And that is the Lotus Sutra, the self-practice. Don't need to belong to anything other than the human race. The, hum the, the life, the universe itself is life. The same process is true for a quasar or an asteroid or a baby deer or an ant or a plate of grass or a human being. We all follow the same rules. Sounds like science, doesn't it? Science doesn't accept an idea about something until it's tested and tested and looked at every way. And then even if everything looks like it's right, it has to make predictions. And then you go and test those predictions. And if those predictions happen the way you think, understand things are working, then that's it. That's the truth. Well, that's how Buddhism works, right? Who among us hasn't heard the idea that just, just try chanting for three months and see if it doesn't change your life? actual proof in life it's not some mystical thing you don't have to wait till after you're dead it's right near here and now is your enlightenment that's a major major upheaval in the concept of living a human life independently we need one another because we're symbiotic animals right but enlightenment is a deeply personal thing. You either turn the light on or you don't. Stumble around the attic, sh bump your shins and hit your head and all of that stuff. You don't have to do that. That's that paradigm that life is suffering, right? Bring a freaking flashlight with you. Put a light in there and click it on. Give yourself the opportunity to live life fully. That's Buddhism. So anytime somebody's teaching Buddhism and starting to put these tripwires in front of you, they're not teaching Buddhism. And this is what Nichiren's pointing out. So he asked the question for them. Which pure land should practicers of the Lotus Sutra pray to be reborn in? First of all, we don't pray. We don't ask for gifts from outside of ourselves. Our enlightenment is in our mind. It's in our experience. We own it individually. So there's no praying going on. There's only instantiating, invoking that which is already there to be experienced by self. So which pure land should practices of the Lotus Sutra instantiate to be reborn in, not after death, Reborn in this very next moment. Birth, death, birth, death, birth, death, birth, death, birth, death. Right? 3,000 realms in a single thought moment. Make a choice. Because there's a bunch of Buddhahood in those realms. Right? So what are you going to focus on? The hell of animality? The hell of hunger? <laughs> I, I want, I want, I want. Or are you going to focus on bodhisattva and Buddhahood? Buddhahood clarity. No craving. Being maximal. All that you can be. Hmm? Make a decision. So that's the pure land. The pure land is right now. It's just a matter of your perception. So here's the answer, Nichiren says. It is stated in the 16th chapter on the lifespan of the Buddha. See, he doesn't say, I say this. I, the great teacher, Nietzsche. He never says that. He says, me, the humble man, son of a fisherman, who's studied all of this for a very long time. My entire life has been dedicated to studying this. And look what I found in the Lotus Sutra. It states in this chapter that the essence of the Lotus Sutra, consisting of 28 chapters, quote, 
I will always stay in this Saha world, end quote. I being Buddha. I reside here always. And, quote, this world of mind is at peace, end quote. This world of mind being here and now, this which he's always in, the Buddha mind. According to these statements, the eternal true Buddha, the orig origin of all Buddhas in manifestation, right? Remember, everything is an emanation of Shakyamuni Buddha. Imagination, it's not real. But Shakyamuni was a man who experienced Buddhahood. So, right? Get right with that is always in the Saha world, this mundane world. Then why should we wish to be anywhere other than this Saha world? It's Shakyamuni said it himself. This is the pure land. This is the land of Buddha. Why would you want to go anywhere else to find the pure land? Yeah, you see how he's turned that on its head? Actually, they turned it on its head. He's just demonstrating that they've been wrong. He goes on, You should know that there is no pure land other than the very place where the practicer of the Lotus Sutra resides. Why should we concern ourselves seeking a pure land in any other place? Right? Because if you make that assumption then you're also making the assumption that this isn't it. And that is the, the actual heinous error in all of these other sects. They deny your Buddhahood by saying it ain't here. So now they've put you in a place of begging. That's why they talk about prayer and faith and all these other words. And these English translations, they buy into that. Because most of the cultures of the people who translate this into English have been infested with that religious thinking. It does not belong in Buddhism. And Nichiren is right here, smacking it down. I mean, do I need to reread that? It's super clear. According to these statements, the eternal true Buddha, the or origin of all Buddhas in manifestation, our, your Buddha, my Buddha, it's all Buddha, is always in this world. This Saha, whatever you want to call it, mundane, samsaric world. Then why should we wish to be anywhere other than this Saha world? Like he has to say it in another way. You should know that there is no pure land other than than the very place where the practicer of the Lotus Sutra resides. Why the practicer of the Lotus Sutra? Because the Lotus Sutra is that self-realization. That this is Buddha. That is the true teaching of Shakyamuni Buddha. Drop mic. <laughs> right? Why should we concern ourselves seeking a pure land in any other place? It is therefore stated in the 21st chapter on the, quote, divine powers of the Buddha, of the Lotus Sutra, quote, wherever scrolls of the sutra are placed, whether it may be in a garden, a forest, under a tree, in a monastery, a layman's house, a palace, a mountain, a valley, or a wilderness, you should know that it is the very place to practice Buddhism. That's the whole meaning of the Butsudan. We enshrine our mandala of the Lotus Sutra in the stupa, the treasure tower, which is our gohonzon, our internal realization. We embody it in something physical so that we can transmute our samsaric, this physical existence into the mental perception that this is the pure land. This is the amazing opportunity to manifest all potential. We can witness it because of mind. Buddhism is about the mind. Attitude and intent. 
What is your intent based on? Money? Power? Or the amazing function of the universe of which we swim in? We're surrounded by it. We are it. If we view the world in that perspective, suddenly everything is amazing, reverent, we have compassion because it's so overwhelming. Or do you want to reduce it into, I have six of those, you only have four. <laughs> I'm better. What the hell is that? It's not Buddhism, right? That false competition of ownership. I don't want to lose that. I want to get more of that. You already have it all. You have this entire universe. What more could you want? Why would you want? You've got more than you can experience right now. The Nirvana Sutra states, quote, you should know, gentlemen that and gentle ladies, that when, wherever this Nirvana Sutra spreads becomes the pure land as indestructible as a diamond. There it is again in the Nirvana Sutra, which is the support document to the Lotus, right? Inhabited by people with bodies as imp Im imperishable as a diamond. Those who believe in pra and practice the Lotus Nirvana Sutras thus should not seek the pure land anywhere other than the very place where they, believers of this sutra, reside. You're in it. You can decide not to acknowledge it and experience it. Oh, woe is you. Come on. Right? Question. Sutras such as the Flower Garland Sutra, Hodo, now he's impersonating all of those powers that be, questioning him on this because they still don't want to get it. Sutras such as the Flower Garland Sutra, Hodo Sutras, Wisdom Sutra, Agama Sutras, and the Sutra of Meditation on the Buddha of Infinite Life, their favorite, recommend being reborn in the Tushita heaven of Bodhisattva Maitreya, the pure land of the Buddha of Infinite Life to the west and pure lands all over the universe. The Lotus Sutra too recommends being reborn in the Tushita heaven, pure land to the west, and pure lands throughout the universe. Why do you contradict these sutras and recommend this impure land filled with tile, stones, and thorny shrubs? <laughs> right, they're, they're pointing out on everything that they, that's physical that they hang on to. So, curious, how's Nietzsche going to answer that? The pure lands preached in the pre-Lotus expedient sutras are mere substitutes tentatively shown by replicas of Shakyamuni Buddha. Right? They're stories based on his imagination, like Amida and like countless other bodhisattvas and Buddhas that he used for storytelling to get people to start thinking. The eternal true Buddha, Shakyamuni. In fact, they are all lands of impurity. Therefore, when the true pure land was described in, quote, the lifespan of the Buddha chapter of the Lotus Sutra, the essence of which consists of chapters on the expedients and the lifespan of the Buddha, or the Tathagata, it was declared that this Saha world is the true pure land of tranquil light. Right? He's quoting it directly again. As, as for the question why the Lotus Sutra also recommends the Tushita heaven, the realm of peace and substance, sustenance, pure land of the Buddha of infinite life, and pure lands all over the universe, it is merely that designations of the pure lands such as Tushita heaven and realm of peace and sustenance, preached in the pre-Lotus Sutra, are used without modification to name the pure lands to be established in this world. It is like names of the three vehicles, Sharvaka, 
Pratyaka Buddha and Bodhisattva mentioned in the Lotus Sutra, which does not actually preach three different teachings. It preaches the soul teaching leading to Buddhahood. It is stated in the Lotus Sutra, chapter 23, that those who practice this sutra will immediately be reborn in the world of happiness. In the annotations on the words and phrases of the Lotus Sutra, don't take my word for it, Fasil 10, Grandmaster Miao Lo interprets, quote, this does not mean that the pure land of the Buddha of infinite life preached in the Sutra of Meditation on the Buddha of infinite life. His interpretation is the same as stated above. People today, Nichiren goes on, without karmic relations with the Lotus Sutra, wish wishing to be reborn in the pure land of the West, are in fact praying for rebirth in the land of rubble, giving up the Samha world, which is the true pure land. People who do not believe in the Lotus Sutra will not be able to be reborn, even in such lands as the Tushita heaven and realm of peace and sustenance, which are in reality the pure lands in this Saha world given such temporary names. Now, that might be confusing to read. Let me say it in another way. When we teach our children, do we not tend by, by sincere effort to reach our children's minds because they're not fully developed to simplify things. Yeah. I mean, I could use obvious examples like Santa and, uh, uh, you know, um, bunnies that lay eggs and <laughs> um, just all manner of stories that we tell children or we drive into them, look both ways before you cross the street don't talk to stink, right? We make these little rules up. But knowing as adults that they're not imperatives, but they indicate a type of thinking that you need to operate in our society, in this world, right? We do that all the time with children. We need to make it simple, a sound bite, something to go, oh, I know what that means. We teach them to look both ways. What does that mean? Look to the right. Are there any cars coming? Then look to the left. Are there any cars coming? And if you see any cars, or even if you don't, as you begin to walk through the road, look again and keep looking left and right because those cars come up on you so fast. And the moment you see one, get the heck out of the road. Right? But we don't get into the complexities of if it's coming from your right, then you go back. If it's coming from your left, then you go forward. You, we don't get into all that mishmash. We just don't. We want them to be afraid of cars. <laughs> if we accomplish that, we're done as parents. We can't do any more than that other than helicoptering over them all the time. <laughs> right? We call those helicopter moms. I don't know why moms have to have this sole responsibility, but we still live in a dichotomy, don't we? Okay. So this is what Nichiren is pointing out and what Shakyamuni pointed out and Miao Lo and every scholar since Shakyamuni. That these provisional teachings, these early simplifications, were to get an idea into the mind, an idea into the way you think about the world you experience. And then in the Lotus Sutra, the self-practice sutra, the ultimate, okay, now this is how I, Shakyamuni, did it, and you can do it the same. All of those earlier teachings, they were just to get you to think correctly. But now, I'm telling you, all of that are just provisional. They're not, they're not the end-all be-all of what you should be understanding. They were just helpful tools to get you to start realizing. And now in the Lotus, I'm telling you, boom, this is it. This is 
This is the Saha world is the pure land. It's because of your mind that it either is or it isn't. Change your mind. Buddhism is about the mind, attitude and intent, attitude and intent. Constantly. And that's a consistent message throughout. But if you don't want to hear it, you're just going to choose to hear all these stories like they're real. Well, we live in a world of human beings that like escapism. But do you believe in the Die Hard movies? <laughs> right? Do you believe in science fiction? It's wonderful entertainment, but it's not real. <laughs> right? You know this, but how many people do you know that kind of run their lives by fantasy? And they'll look at you and smile like they know something you don't. <laughs> oh my goodness. Talk about obstacles, right? So now we're going to start a new chapter. And uh, as I've been doing lately, I think that's long enough for this one. The next section, three, the Nirvana Sutra for Amplifying the Lotus Sutra. In this third section, I would like to state that the Nirvana Sutra was preached to elaborate the Lotus Sutra. <coughs> that should be very enlightening. I look forward to hearing what Nietzsche has to say on that. So I hope you got something out of this uh, little lecture today. Uh, let me know your thoughts in the comments. That's what the comments are for. If you have a, a, a really perturbing question that you that you want some kind of insight into, um, please email me directly at T L K Sylvain S Y L V A I N at gmail.com. Um, so far, I've been able to answer every letter. And I try to see all the comments, but uh, I'm so pleased that th the problem I'm looking forward to is that I can't get to all the comments or, or emails. Uh, we're well on our way to a thousand subscribers. Um, that's a benchmark in YouTube. It's not a benchmark for me, but if it makes these cha this channel and these videos more accessible to people simply because of some silly algorithm, I'll take it. Right? So, please like and subscribe. Share if you know people who might be interested. Especially people who've started pra practicing uh, Nietzsche's Doctrine of the Lotus Sutra and quit because they probably had bad teachers or they were misunderstanding and they didn't have somebody to help them get it let's make sure that we don't lose anyone to misunderstandings and and poor teachers and let's not that, let that get in the way of this amazing teaching yeah and again for that and so many reasons i'm so deeply grateful for your eyeballs and your ears Please like, subscribe, please download the audio podcast. If there are any help to you, you can listen to them. You can use them to, to, if you invite a friend or two or whatever over to chant with you and you get together and uh, maybe there's, you guys are talking and there's some subject that you want to, uh, to talk about and you're not sure where to go, what to look for. The, the, looking through the catalog of uh, podcasts or videos, can be a teaching tool. You just take uh, five minutes of it and go, let's talk about that. See if we understand it. See, see, maybe we need to email Seafood Sylvain and ask him clarification. Find ways to use these tools. They're all free to you. They're here just for us to solidify our conviction, our confidence, our resolve in Namo Myoho Renge Kyo, yeah? And the patrons out there, those of you who are able to send financial support through Patreon or PayPal, you guys are golden. 
So thank you so much from all of us, right? In the meantime, have fun, chant, keep your practice strong, and I'll see you in the next one. All right? Bye for now.